Welcome to L University. My name is Reverend Ezekiel. Today we're going to be going over what you will be getting from L University should you enroll in our classes. L University is going to teach you first and foremost how to correct your status and how to become a secured party creditor with an operable trust. So we're going to start here with the intro. We will teach you how to become a secured party creditor, how to correct your status, and how to form and operate your trust. Three simple points, that's to begin with. We're also going to cover many other areas. For example, we're going to cover bonds. The bonds that we cover are going to have to do with all bonds, but primarily with penal bonds performance bonds bid bonds and affidavits individual surety. Now, your word is your bond. You've heard that term. You've heard the term that HJR 192 is a supersidious bond. You may have seen trucks drive by that were contractors of some sort that say licensed, insurance, and bonded, or insured and bonded, bonded and insured. There's a difference between having an insurance policy and being bonded, okay? On a bond, nine times out of ten, the money is in there. Whatever the money may be is already in the bond. It's secured. For example, let's say you want to be a no republic for the state of Texas, and you apply to the state of Texas. One of the criteria that they are going to have, that you're going to have to meet, in order to be appointed as a no republic for Texas, is you're going to have a bond. You're going to have to have a bond with a specific company for a specific amount of money, and that's in the event that anything goes wrong. You notarize some documents without checking somebody's ID. You notarize some documents that you know are fraudulent. Whatever. I, I mean, there's many, many things. You uh, go outside of your um, uh, scope of your of your duties, and it affects someone negatively. I, I don't want to use the term hurt, but you get the point. That's what the bond's for. And then the, if that happens, the state of Texas is going to cash that bond out and put those funds into their own account. And that's their funds. And then in addition to that, if they, if they see fit, depending on the severity of the situation, they can also levy fines or penalties against you as well. But that bond is, is basically protecting you. Now, Walmart, if you want to work for Walmart and you're some big, huge framing contractor or something, a plumber, nine times out of ten, you're going to have to be bonded. Okay? You're working for Safeway or, uh, you know, Home Depot. They're not going to normally let contractors into their establishment to work on their businesses that aren't bonded. They don't have a, a Dun & Bradstreet number. that aren't highly verified because they're Fortune 500 companies. They're C corporations. They're not going to take a chance of you being some type of something other than what they're expecting you to be when you operate on their building, which is they expect you to be top-notch, professional, and have all your, your I's uh, dotted and your T's crossed. So, we're going to go over bonds and how you can use them and how you can create them and back up things that you're doing. The penal bonds are specific to people uh, that are, uh, you know, end up in court, end up in prison. 
So those will those will uh, handle those types of things. But the bid bonds and the performance bonds are bonds that you can op that you can use in daily operations, in daily functions as a secured party creditor. And we're going to go over that. And the right. affidavit of individual surety ultimately verifies that these bonds are good and that you're the surety for those bonds. Okay, now, in addition to that, again, we're going to go over penal bonds, performance bonds, bid bonds, affidavits of individual surety, and we will touch on some other bonds as well. In addition to that, we're going to go over specific topics of importance. We're going to go over in-depth HJR 192 and why it matters so much. We're going to go over the Federal Reserve Act and how it affects us today and how it affected HJR 192 and the Uniform Commercial Code. Now, keep in mind that this is knowledge that you absolutely need. This is not a cakewalk. If you're on this path, you're going to run into situations where you have to fight through, where you have to push your paperwork, where you have to actually work for the outcome. This isn't a magic, uh, uh, this isn't a spell that's going to make all your problems go away. It's going to put you in a position to deal with your problems effectively, okay? So even if you're sitting back and you're going, uh, I, don't, I don't care about the Federal Reserve Act. I'd rather not hear about it uh, and move on. Uh, HCR 192, I've heard enough about it, and I want to move on. I cannot allow that here. And the reason is because if you don't understand these things and can't apply them to what you're doing, you're going to fail. Never stop learning. You need to learn if, hard if, you're going to walk this path, you're going to need to know these things. And all these fundamental, all these fundamental principles within the commercial redemption movement. We're going to go over liability. Where is the liability? You hear me say it all the time. Where is it? How do you satisfy the liability? Now you can go through and you can do your condition, uh, conditional acceptance for values. You can do your uh, your credit offset, uh, your excuse me, your mutual offset credit exemption exchange, your MOSI or your CAFB as they're called, or CAF4B some people call them. Ultimately though, you can't do that unless you're a secured party creditor. You will hear accounts, say that you're already a secured party creditor just by virtue of your of your life. Technically, that is true. David Robinson says the same thing in his books. Okay? It is technically true. But if you don't, if you don't claim that outright through public notice, through securing your assets and putting a lien on your straw man, then you're not under the principles and rules of their public policies, which we do live in, you're not a secured party. They're going to assume that you are not, and they do not have to honor, they don't have to honor your um, presentments. And that's the bottom line. We are technically secured parties by virtue of our lives because the SESTA trust was made in our name, our all caps name. And so you have that argument. But that argument is simply not going to stand up against things. I actually have to stop this video. I'm going to come right back. My dog needs to go outside. I apologize. Okay, sorry for the interruption, but it's a new dog, and we didn't want her to, I uh, didn't want her to have to wait. So again, I apologize for that. Normally that doesn't happen, but again, I'm just pushing this on my Instagram, uh, on my YouTube, just to get it out there so you guys can have an, uh, an introduction to what you're getting if you enroll in our, our, our uh, classes, like I said. Now, the, the liability, 
uh, is gonna, we're gonna go over that. That's gonna be important. Uh, again, the CAFE, the MOSI, all that stuff, you can do all that, but ultimately there is liability. There is liability created and there's a way to satisfy that liability and get away from it. And once you do, there is, there is a way to access funds that they're creating on your name. For example, uh, Congress and the Senate pass a bill. They want to send a bunch of money over to Libya or Egypt or whatever. And guess who's responsible for it, right? Citizens, whatever. I'm not a citizen. You're not a citizen. But they believe we are unless we say we are not, okay? So they create that money. And that money is owed by our straw man. But I am not a, a 14th Amendment U.S. citizen. I'm an American national. I've corrected my status. Presumably you have corrected your status or you're in the process of doing so and opting out of this. That money was still created on your straw man. So let's say, I like to use this term because I'm not going to I'm not gonna crunch a bunch of numbers uh, over this analogy because it's ultimately... It's easy. It's going to be easy to comprehend. The bill is created for a specific amount of money, which results in each person owing fifty-seven thousand dollars a piece. That's your son, your daughter, your other son, your other daughter, you, your wife, your brother, your sister, your mother, your dad. Everyone has that fifty-seven thousand on our heads, according to guess who? The United States Department of the Treasury and the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve and their their ilk. In the IRS, they believe that all of us, our straw men, owe that money, and they're gonna they're gonna disseminate that information to the appropriate agencies, for example, the Treasury, to collect on it, the IRS to collect on it, and they're gonna the the Treasury's gonna print the money, the IRS gonna try to collect on it. But ultimately, that fifty-seven thousand, if you've done your paperwork properly, and you and you file a notice about that bill when it's being created, saying that you do not agree. To it, you do not. Voting is absolutely. I don't want to be disrespectful for, to anybody, so I'm not going to use the M word. But it's not smart. Voting is not smart. You register to vote. Anything you register, you turn over title to. So when you register to vote, you go in and you vote. You're turning over title to your straw man. You could be a you could be a secured party creditor, and still turn your straw man back over. Again, invisible contracts, adhesion contracts, everything that you engage in from day to day in the public arena can, can pull you right back in and make you have to start from scratch or do new notices. Okay? So that 57,000 theoretical, that theoretical 57,000 is can be tendered to your straw man in the event that you do the notice and ask for that bond to be... Uh, to be released to you. Okay, now we're going to go into that in depth, but again, that's another, that's one I'm getting questions about all the time. It's one that people want to know about how to do. Not just can I uh, extinguish debt, discharge debt, get a credit offset, but can I leverage my account to be able to use money? Okay, whatever, currency, credit, whatever it is, but can I access that in order to leverage my account? against things that I want of real value to me? The answer is yes, and I will show you how, but it's in the university only. We're going to go over what the difference is between a private citizen and a, and a public citizen is. Okay? And we're going, to go over, we're going to go over what it means to call yourself a citizen. All right? Private citizen versus public citizen. And I'm going to give you a spoiler alert right now, okay? You ready? There's no difference, okay? There's going to be more to this, so I'm not worried about the spoiler, but a private citizen, okay, and a public citizen are both citizens. You cannot separate yourself from the matrix while calling yourself a citizen, okay? It doesn't even matter if you're a state citizen. You say, I'm a state citizen under the Constitution. First of all, the Constitution does not apply to you. Remember that, okay? So, uh, public citizen, private citizen, state citizen, 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 citizen. If you're a citizen, you are a subject to the country that you live in. You're a subject. A subject is a slave, okay? It's someone that's in bondage. 
that, that has to answer to someone else. If you are a citizen, you are in the matrix, under their jurisdiction, in their law venue, okay? So you don't want to use that word. And if you hear somebody saying it, that's teaching you something, run. Because that individual has no idea what he's talking about, okay? You have to use other terms, other available terms, such as national, okay? When you apply for a passport or... You apply for FAFSA, there is a difference expressed between an American national and a U.S. citizen. They're on there for a reason. You're a national, not a citizen, okay? If you're a citizen, you're a subject. Nationals are not subject to the countries they are that they live in, but they are still afforded all of the benefits and privileges and rights secured by being from that nation. So you get all the benefits, none of the restrictions. Okay, it's kind of like a 508c1a religious ministry versus a 501c3 uh, nonprofit corporation. Okay, dig the difference, and you will understand this stuff in a manner that will keep you from getting yourself in trouble. Okay, we're dealing with. A government that will lie to get FISA warrants against people knowing they're lying and not be touched. Okay, we live in a nation where the government can, can, uh, can effect a coup against a sitting president and walk away. No problem. No, no charges, nothing. We've seen many reports come out, including the Durham report, that proves the FBI was behind all of that. And yet nobody was taking a task for it. My video is probably going to get taken down over that now that I think about it. Oops. Whatever. I'll, re I'll redo the video if it does. And I'll keep this copy. That way I can still show you guys what I said one way or another. But the bottom line is whatever. Allegedly, uh, they, the coup was affected and nothing happened to anyone. We've seen with our own eyes what has happened. So when you're dealing with a government like that, MK Ultra, John F. Kennedy, Lee Harvey Oswald, all the different things that they've done, Area 51, the lies about dinosaurs and flat earth and all that, what do you think they're going to do to you? Huh? If you're not prepared, if you don't have all your ducks in a row, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to strip you down like a child and send you on your way crying. Okay? And that's if you're lucky. So you have to know what you're doing. You have to know the difference between things like this and what this means and what this means and how you can use it if I say HGR-192 is a supersidious bond, and you're like, I'm tired of hearing about HGR-192, and it's time to use your supersidious bond, you didn't want to hear anything else about HGR-192. Think about that. So we have to understand these things. And this is ultimately the power for, I didn't write that part down, but the bill. We'll just say a true bill. We'll say a true bill. Excuse me. True bill notice. Because that's what it's called. A true bill notice means that they created a bill on your head that you did not agree to and do not consent to, okay? True bill notice, boom. You have to understand this to understand this, and you have to understand this to understand any of it, okay? Now, let me tell you also that there are many manuals on the Internet right now that you can get uh, various different sources that talk that are manuals from the government against people who claim to be sovereign, people who claim to be secure party creditors, and they try to refute it. I told you in another video about the bar, how there's there's organizations that disseminate false information in order to convince people that things aren't true, like the British Credit Registry, and they come up with that that nonsense about the rail that only separates the audience from the court from the judge and from the attorneys and from the defendants and from the plaintiffs, they claim that that, that means that they've, they've been brought into the bar and they're in the interfold. Again, no, that's not what it is. They're esquires. That is a title of dignity given to attorneys since they since it originated in Britain, okay? And every single, some will use the term, this is the funniest part, you think about this. A lot of attorneys will use the term esquire, but a lot of them will not. Why? They're all esquires. Every this is not this is not uh, information that you would have to dig for. Call an attorney. 
anyone you want, just pick the phone book up and call one and ask them. Make sure it's not an Esquire. Make sure that they don't have ESQ or Esquire by their name. Okay, it could say anything else. It could say PLLC, it could say law firm, it could say law offices of, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that it doesn't say Esquire. That way you can ask them if they are an Esquire. And they're going to say yes. They're going to say that they are. So why not use it? It's all smoke and mirrors. You know, sometimes you see banks close down and new banks come in. That's all smoke and mirrors too. It's all part of the Federal Reserve Bank. So when they close down a bank, making it seem like they went out of business and another bank picks it up, they just want you to think that's how it goes. They want you to believe that there's a system to all of this and that all those banks aren't the exact same people. That at the end of the day, they all answer to that, to this. Bang, right here. Every single one of them. So why do they close down and go out of business? And then all of a sudden a new bank comes in. It's all marketing. That's all it is. So we're gonna to touch on all of that. I'm gonna get you up to speed with all of that. We're gonna talk about trade names. Yes, I know you've heard trade names and Ed Legis and straw man, but I'm gonna show you how to do a common law trademark, a common law copyright. I'm gonna show you how you can use DBAs and assumed names all while operating secured under your original uh, John Q Public Trust, whatever your name is, trust, etc. Okay, now straw man trust is not the name of my actual trust, but it is a trademark. And uh, Ends Legis or L University is a trademark. L Ministries, 50, 508C1A, Religious Ministry, is my trademark. And they're all copyrighted and trademarked under the common law. Now, I want to tell you something, too, that, that you need to understand when you're operating with the UCC and common law and you're interchanging the two. They each represent something specifically different. Yeah, you know, probably from me, maybe from someone else, the common law represents the law on land, and the UCC represents the law on water. But it's more than that. UCC deals with secured transactions. The common law deals with real property. Uh, you see the difference? That's a huge difference. Now, can you put real property in a UCC1 financing statement? Yes. But your real property should all go on the security agreement primarily. Again, UCC is for securities, for liens, and things like that, for commerce. The real property and all of that is under common law jurisdiction. Anybody telling you any different is wrong and you need to look it up for yourself because all of this information is researchable on your own. So I'm going to teach you trade names. I'm going to teach you, cop uh, excuse me, I'm going to teach you trade names, I'm going to teach you trademarks, I'm going to teach you how to do common law copyrights and DBAs and assumed names. How to use them effectively, okay, and to include them in your commercial package. Uh, we're going to go over 1099As, 1099Bs, 1099OIDs, all that good stuff. Everything that you're wanting to hear on that level is going to be included in this, in this course. We're going to go over the WA ban, what it is specifically, and how you can use it, and how you can apply it to your affairs. We're going to go over uh, authenticating the birth certificate, how to go about doing that, and the difference between letters of postule and authentication. There is a difference. And you are going to find out what the difference is and what you should use based upon your own instinct after learning uh, in, in, the, in the execution of your findings. So stay tuned, stay sovereign, and do not consent.